the inside story. She's the biggest con woman Australia has ever seen. A tyrant, a bully. He's a master manipulator. No, you. Shamelessly fleecing the rich and the famous. Millions, millions of dollars. It's a lot, isn't it? Dirty. It's like stealing from your parents. Rotten. I fell in love with him. Swindlers. Gina Rita Subramanian. How this timid accountant stole $45 million. No fun. Eight properties, jewellery, clothing. Her spectacular lunchtime shopping sprees. 20, 30,000. And her bizarre love triangle, right under the noses of unsuspecting workmates. And the deluded fraudster. All of it was the biggest lie. Who ripped off a fortune from wealthy investors. He broke me. So cocky. I'm untouchable, I'm untouchable, I'm untouchable. So heartless. I'd never experienced that, um, that connection. How it all comes crashing down. He's hiding in a cupboard somewhere. Just before you say anything, you're oh. under arrest for sure. all related matters. Hello, I'm Leila McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. We've all done it, been a bit careless with the truth. And some go a step further, fiddle their work expenses or try to fool the tax man. But imagine having the nerve to live a total lie, to con people day after day after day. We're talking about brazen frauds that raked in millions and millions of dollars. And for a long time, the con artists you're about to meet actually got away with it, living like the rich and famous they so desperately wanted to be. I am extremely well trained as a martial arts expert. I was uh, trained as a, a military officer in, intellig in intelligence service. Dimitri DeAngelis has all the traits of a very clever con man. He's heartless, predatory and a great actor. Foster parents put a gun on me, on, my, on me when I was 16 years old. He's also a compulsive liar. We believe that everything Dmitri ever said um, wasn't true. For decades, Dmitri paraded as a multi-millionaire, pretending the prestige cars, flash boats and grand houses were all his. Not to mention the friends in high places. So that is when I met um, my kind of idol, Bill Clinton. But it was all just an elaborate facade, all part of a series of audacious cons that netted him an absolute fortune, a cool eight and a half million dollars. He was over the top, he was slimy, and he was a good con man. That's my favorite. When he's on James Packer's body. James Packer, yeah. As we'll see tonight, Dimitri was shameless. It's mine. That, that's your favourite. Dimitri praying with the Dalai Lama. Anything to dupe gullible investors into believing his shiny success story. Some of the photos are ridiculous, aren't they? They are ridiculous, yeah. But there's a, uh, there's a, a sprinkling of real ones in amongst the Photoshop ones. And that's his secret, really, isn't it? That's his secret. Always mix up a little bit of truth with the fantasy and you never, you never know. We believed everything he said, in fact. Everybody believed everything he said because he was so wealthy. Certainly with Dimitri DeAngelis, it's difficult to work out fact from fiction. He claimed he was a street kid who inherited a fortune from a mysterious benefactor. He bragged about working with some of the world's biggest corporations. What we do know for sure is that he was very good at fleecing the unsuspecting. Over the years, he befriended and conned many astute investors, people who should have known better. How much money did you give Dimitri? It started off at 50k, then it went to 100k and another 100k and uh, by the end it was, yeah, about 330, 350k, thousand. And that was when you sold your business and you sold your apartment, it was everything you had? Everything. But it wasn't just hard-earned nest eggs Dimitri was stealing, he was also stealing hearts. What did you like about him at the end of those two weeks? Like about him, I fell in love with him. Um, it's how he was to me. He made you feel special? Yeah, never. I'd, I'd never experienced that, um, that connection of what a man could make me feel like. Mm. He targeted um, people from very um, well-to-do backgrounds, people that were intelligent people, that, that already had made a lot of money, and some people that had were looking forward to a very nice and comfortable retirement. Regina, can you please state your full name and date of birth? Regina Rita Subramaniam, 
15th of the 5th, 1969. While Dimitri DeAngelis was loud, charismatic and very showy, Regina Subramaniam was the exact opposite. She was demure and reserved, a plain woman. S-U-B-R-A-M-A-N-I-A-M. You may not remember her name, but you won't forget her story. I just really can't explain. As we'll see later, Regina Subramaniam pulled off one of the biggest frauds in Australian corporate history, embezzling $45.3 million from her employer, ING. As one of the old staff said to me, it's like stealing from your parents. Would you buy that sort of items of clothing for your wife? No. And she almost got away with it. Chanel. Lots of Chanel. She bought eight properties. She spent money on jewellery, uh, clothing, cosmetics, accessories and lifestyle. Had she confided in anybody at all? Not that we're aware of. But the innocent looking Regina Subramaniam had more surprises in store. $1,000 wrapped up in a white envelope. As police delved into the massive fraud, they discovered evidence of a bizarre love triangle involving Regina, her husband and a senior executive at work. When I found out later that there'd been a um, sexual relationship, I was absolutely appalled. But first, Dimitri DeAngelis, celebrity sycophant and greedy, brazen con man. Dimitri played his victims like a maestro, but much like his piano playing, it was all a lie. He wasn't the successful multi-millionaire businessman he pretended to be, and he certainly couldn't play the piano. True to form, this is a pianola. My name is originally Yugoslav Russian. I first met Dimitri DeAngelis in 2010. I mean, five years, they had no problem, and suddenly they complain now. He'd just been charged with fraud, but he eagerly welcomed me into his home. And naturally, he was denying any wrongdoing. Is everything that you've told me today true? Everything I have said today is implicitly true. But within three years, Dimitri would be behind bars. Just before you say anything, you're under arrest for fraud-related matters. Convicted of defrauding investors in his latest money-making scam, a sham recording business called Emporium Music. We have country music, we have rock, we have dance music. So he seemed very genuine. I liked him a lot. I really got on well with him. Peter Schoonins was one of the many investors so blinded by Dimitri's charm that they thought of him more as a friend than a business partner. I gave him $100,000 to invest in the, in the stock market and the $100,000 for Emporium. Peter, a retired aerospace engineer, was in good company. Other investors included a top-flight Victorian barrister, a professor at one of Australia's leading business schools, Paul Keating's sister Anne, and the former Deputy Lord Mayor of Sydney, Marcel Hoff. Each gave Dimitri tens of thousands, if not millions, to invest in Emporium Music. What was it that enticed them about the investment? It looked good to, to a lot of people who are very intelligent people and leaders in their field. Fraud investigator Michael Gironda says what was so humiliating for many of these investors was that Dimitri conned them with their own hard-earned cash. So pretty much he was taking people's money and then entertaining them lavishly with their own money. That's right. And they were giving him more money. Giving him more money because he was he was so successful because he was spending so much money. Sure. You do not have to say or do anything unless sure. you wish. Sure. Anything you say may be used in court as sure. evidence. Do you understand that? Yes, I do understand that. Even when the law finally caught up with him, Dimitri's hapless investors couldn't get any of their money back. The cupboard was bare. He'd blown the lot. Or at least, so it seemed. And how much did they lose? Millions, apparently millions of dollars. So some people, 100,000, they were handing out checks, some 50,000, some million dollars, and then they were talking to their friends, and the domino effect from it all is mind-boggling, mind-boggling. Coming up on Inside Story, love you. how Dimitri seduced... I fell in love with him. ...his unsuspecting oh, victim. Everybody believed everything he said. Dimitri DeAngelis appeared to have it all. Plenty of money and all the right connections. 
But his story was all the more seductive to prospective investors because of his supposedly humble beginnings in France. He really drew people in through his hard life and his upbringing, uh, and people really felt sorry for him. According to the well-worn legend, Dimitri was orphaned as a baby, then taken in by an abusive foster family that used him as a domestic slave. In France, they were placing children like they were giving a chicken into a family. It was terrible. Always with an eye for the dramatic, he claimed he was thrown onto the streets at age 16, naturally enough, at gunpoint. When I slept on the street of Paris, I also was confronted with um, reality again. Well, Dimitri's idea of reality. The conniving con man says that while living on the streets of Paris, he met this man, Angolan singer Raoul Ndipwo, who became his spiritual father. Wowie! Why Raoul did exist and was very wealthy, it's highly unlikely the two were friends. But according to the French man of Faux, when Raoul passed away in Portugal in 2006, he left him a fortune. Did you inherit $52 million and a castle in Portugal? I inherited money and I inherited things. The sum cannot be discussed because I want to keep that very uh, Private. Was there any evidence that he ever did stay in a castle or have a spiritual father who was a musician? Uh, no evidence at all. So you're an orphan, a street kid, a yes. model, an intelligence officer, yes. a martial arts expert, <laughs> yes. and a record label owner. That's right. And it's a lot, isn't it? When, if you were to say this to someone that is, um, have a, a normal life, they will say, this is, there is something wrong there. We believed everything he said, in fact. Everybody believed everything he said because he was so wealthy. So if he had a castle, yes, he had a castle, why not? We had been to so many other very expensive houses already, you know, that he claimed was his. So another one, why not? Terry B is an art dealer in Melbourne. He was friends with Dimitri for 17 years, introducing him to a handful of his own clients who invested with the Ford stuff. You like a bit of colour? Oh yes. We sell happiness here, not just painting. That's, <laughs> what, that's the intention, yes. And he was always very kind to me because obviously now I understand that my database was much more lucrative than me handing a few thousand dollars to invest in his company. And so he was very, very generous to me. So he could actually access some of the, the people that I knew. Was there ever a moment where you saw through him or you suspected him? I did question, because sometimes it was just too much to be true. But then you see contracts and lawyers and, and lawyers investing in the company and business people who are supposedly educated and savvy. And so he was clever. Dimitri hungered for money and social standing, but the only real jobs he had were quite modest. To get what he so desperately wanted, Dimitri had to lie, cheat and steal. And to do that, he had to convince his wealthy victims that he was one of them. He was so, so convincing, his personality was so overpowering. He, the, the radi he radiated this, this, this energy of a very wealthy, uh, a successful person. Businessman Peter Schoonens was renting a penthouse apartment in the affluent Perth suburb of Scarborough when he met Dimitri. I got a call from the landlord who wanted to sell the apartment and he said, I've got somebody who represents the Malaysian, a Malaysian royal family, would like to have a look at the apartment. I opened the door and there Dimitri walked into my life. Smartly dressed, his French accent filling the space. Oh, I love this. This is beautiful. Who is waving this? his arms around and saying, I own many properties around the world, and no, I don't represent the Malaysian royal family. I'm looking at this for myself. Dimitri began dazzling Peter with his credentials, including, of course, the photos of his high-flying friends. Then the swindle began. Initially, he said, look, I've got all these, all these um, analysts, um, six of them working for me around the clock, and I why don't you 
take the money you wish to invest, give it to me, and I'll give you a 20% return on the sort of money. And I thought, well, you know, 20% on the stock market, if you know the game, you can do it and saves me doing my own homework. He didn't say what he was investing. He said, I'm doing this, let me surprise you. Let me surprise you after two or three years. He did surprise me, absolutely. You know, that was all gone. Perth proved a lucrative hunting ground for Dmitry. On one visit, he met Peter Schoonen's neighbour, Lorraine Velichkovic. Divorced and with her own business, she was the perfect target. And for two weeks, Dmitry wined and dined Lorraine, lavishing her with attention. What did you like about him at the end of those two weeks? Like about him, I fell in love with him. Um, it's how he was to me. I'd never ever... He made you feel special? Yeah. Never. I'd, n I'd never experienced that... Um, that connection of what a man could make me feel like. Mm. Lorraine was completely taken in. Amazed, a high flyer like Dimitri had time for her. I felt privileged that this wonderful man would help me. And how did you communicate with each other after those initial two weeks? Text. It would be 20, 30 times a day. Yeah, it was definitely text the whole time. Dimitri soon had Lorraine mesmerised. Over time, she sold her apartment and her business, willingly handing over the money to the conniving con man, despite the warnings of her best friend. She thought he was a viper, and she was saying, hey, this is nothing but bull. No, not he, and I'm saying, no, Stella, no. Uh, Lorraine, don't do it. He's, he's a con man. He had no fears. He had no fears. That's probably why he pulled off what he did, because he had no fears. He used to say to me, I'm untouchable, I'm untouchable, I'm untouchable. And so I used to think, that's a bit much, that's a bit much. Coming up... Do you have such Yes, we do. Dimitri's um, elaborate scam... It was always a show. ...finally comes unstuck. Did you say anything? Oh. You're under arrest for sure. fraud related matters. How low did you get? I want to die. The smooth-talking Dimitri DeAngelis was well on his way to the wealth and notoriety he so craved. And in 2005 came his most ambitious swindle yet, a company called Emporium Music. We are country music, we have rock, we have dance music. After conning a handful of obscure singers into signing up to his new record label, Dimitri hit the road to drum up interest from investors. And being the good friend he was, Dimitri approached Peter Schoonens with the investment opportunity of a lifetime. He needed obviously seed capital, and for my seed capital of $100,000, um, I would get 30% of the company. Now he had very, very detailed business plans and I thought, wow, this looks quite promising. And uh, yeah, I was quite impressed actually. He, he had real companies, they were properly constituted. He had an office for a while in Tiffley Towers, I don't think it did anything. It was always a show, it was never a real business. But it had to look like it was to get the people in. He harassed people non-stop on the phone and, and emails and would tell them that we're very close, we're so close to hitting the threshold provided to us by ASIC, we just need a little bit more. We're almost ready to float and then we're all going to be super duper rich. And with the returns Dimitri DeAngelis promised he soon had plenty of interest. Dimitri claimed that every 1% share would be worth $6 million when the company was eventually floated in 2009. For Peter Schoonens, that would mean a massive windfall of $180 million. But Dimitri didn't stop there. To make the offer seem more attractive, he falsified documents to make it appear James Packer and Lachlan Murdoch were shareholders in Emporium Music. They weren't, but it was enough to dispel any doubts investors had in his bold new venture. Here I am, living in a dream. I think some of the investors went to dinner with some of the artists in the early stages and the artists were excited because they were fooled and everyone was thinking it was fabulous and it was going to do remarkably well but uh, I think there was only a few CDs produced. And of the handful of CDs that were produced, 
Most were handed out to his investors or strategically placed in shops to feed the illusion of Dimitri's stable of stars. If he was with a particular victim, he would arrange to have maybe some CDs placed in a music shop nearby and then walk past that shop and show, look, look at these CDs, this is my business here, uh, they're selling them here. He was very clever in where he placed his props, which he used to defraud people. While Dimitri captivated investors with Emporium's hot new acts, his two-year relationship with Lorraine Velichkovich was warming up too, or at least that's what she thought. And you got in deep, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I did. I, I came over for a weekend and he said, I think it's about time that you moved to Sydney. And that was like an invite for me to come over and, and be with him more often. And she did just that. Dimitri had already convinced Lorraine to sell her business and hand over the proceeds. Now she sold her Perth apartment to move to Sydney, giving that money to Dimitri too. But that wasn't enough. He demanded even more. He was saying he needed, you know, 340,000 extra, and I just went, oh, and <laughs> um, I said, I'll insult you if I told you how much I could, I could give you so I said the amount and he said oh no 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 you can give me that as well so <laughs> by the time I got to Sydney I was living on virtually nothing. So you stayed here when you moved to Sydney? Yes I moved in here and stayed for six months. And did Dimitri put you up here? No I was paying him rent. You'd sold your house and given him everything and you were paying him rent? That's right. As it turned out, Dimitri didn't even own the apartment, yet he gladly pocketed the $500 a week in rent. How often did you see Dimitri when you moved to Sydney? Yeah, it would have been five, six times. Had you imagined that you would be spending all your time together? Yeah. Did you have a physical relationship? No, no. Did he have a reason why not? He said he had a brain tumour and they were doing experimental drugs on him and he'd said that he couldn't have an erection for two years. As the deadline for the public float of Emporium Music loomed, the truth was closing in on Dimitri DeAngelis. He'd promised investors a handsome payout when the company went public on June 26, 2009. But that day came and went and nothing happened. And the incessant phone calls, emails and texts from Dimitri came to an abrupt end. That's when they all started contacting him, asking him when it's happening. And uh, that's when he started deferring them and putting them off the trail and sending text messages to say he was away, he was in France, he was overseas. Um, every week we started getting a new victim in to uh, tell us what had happened. How low did you get when you found out that it had all been a scam? I wanted to die. I couldn't believe it. Do you have search warrant? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Please show me the warrant. Yes, yes. The gig was finally up, but when Roland Winter and his team arrived to arrest Dimitri at his home on Sydney's North Shore, his longtime boyfriend, yes, his boyfriend, Aaron Hung, denied he was home. So we need to speak to Mr. De Angelis. Oh, all right. He's not here. Oh, you need to tell us where Dimitri is. He was here about 20 minutes ago. And he's hiding in a cupboard somewhere. No, 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 there's no one. There's no one. That's in that bedroom. But police soon found Dimitri. And, smooth as ever, he couldn't be more cooperative. I paid rent here, so okay. I'm, I'm Just only... Just before a... you say anything, uh, you're under arrest for sure. all related matters. As they searched the house, police found some of the precious few CDs Dimitri did actually produce. There was a fake order of Australia medal, electronic records of his meticulously crafted business plans and a number of his prized photos. What they didn't find was any trace of his ill-gotten gains. I just must say that all of you have been extremely polite and extremely well-mannered. Where do you think all their money went? On his props, his cars, his dinners, his holidays. He wouldn't go anywhere economy. Everything was first class and Rolls Royce. I looked at the spending from his accounts. There was a lot of cash, so who knows where that went. You think maybe there's a stash? We can't, we can't tell. But would somebody that clever to pull this off for so long, knowing that there is a risk for him to be put away, would actually come out with nothing at the end of it? To me, it's, I doubt it. Dimitri certainly showed no remorse, and throughout his trial, he denied any wrongdoing. 
He eventually pleaded guilty to the Emporium music scam and is currently serving 12 years in prison for defrauding more than a dozen people of eight and a half million dollars. Yet for all the pain those victims have endured, some inexplicably still have fond memories of the larger than life swindler. I don't regret the time that I was with him because until the truth came out, he never spoke to me ill. He, he filled my heart. I was going to be with him for the rest of my life. So the three years that were so close, I never regretted a moment of that. It's just when, he, when everything went, the truth came out, he broke me. It was exciting and nobody had ever experienced anything like that before. What would you say was the biggest lie Dimitri ever told you? All of it. All of it was the biggest lie. In fact, what I want to know is the, what is the real story? What is, who is this man? How do one become so good at being so bad? Still to come on Inside Story... Regina Rita Subramanian. The mild-mannered accountant who embezzled a fortune. One of the largest individual frauds in Australia. And shopped up a storm. How much would you spend during a lunch break? 20, 30,000. By day, she was a quiet accountant, a trusted executive in a blue chip corporation. By night, she was a mysterious millionaireess, an insatiable shopper who spent a fortune on little luxuries with big price tags and famous labels. And she fooled everyone, even the toughest watchdogs in one of the world's largest financial institutions. Regina Rita Subramanian. She's sweet. Did they tell you that you were under arrest? Yes. Very polite. No, fine. Trust. And most unassuming. And when you say 10, it's $10 million? Rough, yeah, less than 10. Regina Subramaniam is also an A-grade corporate swindler. Up there in the Super League with the likes of Alan Bond and Christopher Scase. How does this compare to other frauds in Australia? Is it one of the largest? It was one of the largest individual frauds in Australia. In the space of just five years, the trusted accounts clerk stole more than $45 million from business giant ING. You don't get ones that are $45 million every day? No, that's our, that's our first one. And nobody at the company suspected a thing? No, it was some years before anyone cottoned on to the fact that she had been uh, defrauding them for a substantial amount of time. Regina spent millions of dollars on prestige real estate and a dazzling array of jewellery and luxury items. But as we'll see tonight, rather than flaunt her treasure trove of designer goods, she squirrelled it away. Much of it piled up around her office, right under the noses of unsuspecting workmates. What about the figure that she embezzled? That was a real shock. It was uh, like a, a unsupervised child in a candy shop. When police searched Regina's office, they found her cache of treasure. Inside 21 boxes like these were the spoils of her shopping sprees. In them were 40 items of clothing from Chanel, Hugo Boss and Armani. There were 200 boxes of Chanel perfumes and cosmetics, 60 Mont Blanc pens, a magnum of vintage Dom Perignon, Swarovski crystals, Michael Jackson memorabilia, an incredible 630 pieces of jewellery, including two special pieces from Bulgari, a $500,000 diamond necklace and a six-carat diamond ring worth 800000 so I would just purchase those and, and bring them back and it would just stay in the office. When Regina was questioned about her massive fraud, she claimed it was revenge for mistreatment at work. It was just a way of uh, um, releasing and comforting the, the hurt and the pain that was inside. Why did she do it? Uh, it made her feel uh, important um, and, and special to go out and buy items of great expense and people knew her wherever she went. And you didn't believe her motivation was anger or revenge? Uh, well, it's quite extreme to, to go to those lengths to steal $45 million over uh, being angry at colleagues at work. 
Whatever her motivation, Regina Subramaniam certainly did have some strange work relationships. In court, evidence would emerge of torrid three-way sexual encounters between Regina, a senior male executive, and her husband, who also worked at ING. In fact, a co-worker told you they were intimate in the office after hours, is that right? The co-worker was working late and uh, the supervisor had come in. They didn't realise that the co-worker was still there. When he got up from behind his workstation, he saw them being intimate in the supervisor's office. And what did you think? I thought, no, nah, can't be true. Nah. Like many workmates, Carol Hurd, an executive assistant at ING, was gobsmacked when news of Regina's crime and her sexual exploits emerged. I was shocked, yes. What was she like? I found her to be very um, quiet, demure. So you wouldn't call her open or friendly? No, or no, she was not a gregarious person, no. Did you ever see her come back from lunch breaks with parcels full of goodies? Only once. I saw her come back with a fancy carrier bag. It had a gold ribbon on it and she looked very excited. Regina started out as a junior accounts clerk at ING back in the late 80s. It was here she met her husband. After nearly 20 years of basic book work and data entry, Regina was dramatically promoted to a top accounting role, much to the disbelief of her colleagues. It was her husband and their lover, the senior company executive, who promoted her. What's your position at ING? Uh, senior, um, senior financial accountant. Mm -hmm. How long have you held that, held that position for? Um, three, four years. In her new role, Regina was a highly trusted employee with unfettered access to ING corporate accounts. She was authorised to transfer a staggering $30 million, and that she did to herself. So began one of the largest frauds in Australian history. While most of her colleagues were out at lunchtime enjoying a quiet sandwich, the unassuming Regina was shopping up a storm. How much would you spend during a lunch break? 20, 30,000. And would that be every lunch break or? No. How often? Twice a week. Okay. How would you bring all the jewelry back into the office? Um, I just pick it up late in the afternoon when everybody was gone. Just pick it up there and just leave it at work. Uh, she started with uh, small transfers the first three or four years and then they started getting a lot larger. She would go and buy jewellery for half a million dollars and uh, take it back to work and store it under her desk at work. Not surprisingly, the stores and boutiques loved Regina. But it wasn't any old shops she was visiting. For Regina, it was all about the pricey designer brands. Bulgari, Paspali, yeah. Chanel, Hugo Boss. And given uh -huh. the endless supply of yeah. loot from ING, money was no object. They just told us that she would come in very frequently and she was a great, a great customer. Regina spent an estimated $13 million at her favourite store, Paspali and her loyalty was rewarded with a holiday on one of the company's luxury pearling boats, along with her husband and her friend, Nolene Keen Ward. Did they give you any gifts in return for their um, um, We just had one trip with Pass Haley. They just took it to Darwin and back, and that was all. Regina also lavished money and gifts on staff at the upmarket stores she patronised. When former Pass Bailey employee Doris Souter wanted to buy a property, Regina gladly obliged. Yeah, she uh, gave Doris uh, 1.3 million as a start-up uh, fund to buy a house. 1.3 million dollars? Yes. What did Doris say about that? Uh, I, I guess Doris was um, initially overcome by it, um, but um, we had to approach later on to, to get that money back in conjunction with ING Holdings. Nolene Keen Ward was even more fortunate. Not only was Regina Supramaniam spending an absolute fortune on jewellery and luxury goods, she was also buying up big in real estate. 
One of those to benefit from her largesse was Nolene Keen Ward, a shop assistant at Chanel, where Regina was her number one customer. Now call her lucky, call her canny, but Nolene bought an apartment in this inner city block for $1.29 million. One year later, she sold it to Regina for $3.1 million, a tidy profit of $1.8 million. A lot of people who met Regina made a lot of money out of her. Yes, well, Regina was spending uh, someone else's money, so uh, she was very generous with, with her outgoings. But given the sheer enormity of her crime, it was only a matter of time before Regina was caught. And while leaving the country for an overseas holiday with her husband, she was arrested at Sydney International Airport. Whose cash was in the account? Oh, geez. Okay. Do you know how much money? Well, 12 million or less than 50, it's definitely not 30, so I don't know where 30 came from. How would you describe Regina's actions? A betrayal. A betrayal of the trust. Did you ever expect, though, that the embezzlement would amount to the amount of money that it did? No, I, I didn't expect any embezzlement. <laughs> Next, Regina comes clean. Did yeah, anyone give you permission? No. How she stole $45 million. Two more bags of information to you. Tell me about the property. Four and Bondi. Three at Kimberley. I couldn't see it, but obviously it was happening. On October 4, 2009, Regina Subramaniam was arrested at Sydney Airport with her family while setting off on an overseas holiday. At first, Regina downplayed her crime acting as if it was little more than petty theft. Did you buy anything else other than jewellery or Chanel? I got some Tiffany's and um, Mont Blanc. That was all. Yeah. Did, you, did you buy any particular pieces of clothing? Oh, Hugo Boss, um, Armani. But police weren't fooled. And while she was being questioned, they visited her home in the neat middle-class suburb of Castle Hill. Two more bags of information to you all. Regina's husband showed them through the house as they searched for evidence. Can you remember you said this before? No. You haven't said that before? No. What did police find at her home? Ah, they, it was a cascade of jewellery, um, clothing, a whole walk-in wardrobe full of items, money. They were, uh, police were there for a long time cataloguing everything, handbags, perfumes, fine fragrances and you know, high-end high clothing you know, filled from uh, top to bottom with their walk-in wardrobe everywhere. Despite being surrounded by box upon box of luxury goods, Regina's husband denied any knowledge of her audacious multi-million dollar fraud. Would you buy that sort of items of clothing for your wife? No. Okay. Would she? I don't know. Surely her husband saw those goods. Oh, well, one would suspect that he laid his eyes on those items. Um, whether he uh, knew exactly where they came from, uh, we don't know. She denied that he knew anything, didn't she? Yes, yeah, she said it was all her doing. Was she and her husband living a lavish lifestyle? No, it uh, wouldn't. Not one of uh, opulence. Uh, it was just an ordinary uh, suburban husband and wife. But their sex life was anything but ordinary. Police soon learned of Regina's raunchy encounters with her husband and their work colleague. They were having some kind of three-way relationship. That's correct. Now, legally, we're not allowed to name that person, but mm. would it be correct to say that he was in a supervisory role? Yes. And he was having a sexual relationship with Regina and her husband? According to what was said in the court, yes. But I, myself, couldn't see it, but obviously it was happening. But despite the sordid rumours and growing unrest with Regina's management style in her newly acquired senior role, most staff felt powerless to act. She was um, a tyrant, a bully, and um, used to verbally abuse the staff. Did you express any concerns about Regina to senior management? On several occasions. What were your main points to them? Well, it was uh, mainly in regard to her treatment of the accounting staff initially and um, the fact that uh, the staff were complaining that she couldn't help them with the higher level accounting 
And what did they do about it? Nothing. What were her qualifications, do you know? As far as I, I know, she had no formal qualifications. While most work colleagues had very little confidence in Regina's financial or management skills, she proved masterful at swindling money out of her employer. Although she later told police it wasn't about the money, she blamed deep-seated psychological problems caused by sexual abuse as a child. She said that she was abused as a child and that she had been abused by somebody at work. Was there any truth to that? Oh, there's not a great deal of evidence to support that assertion. Why was she so angry at the company? Uh, she felt uh, some of the employees uh, had wronged her and uh, she just spent their money as a way of getting back at them and the company. How Regina swindled ING was painfully simple. She transferred more than $17 million into her own bank accounts and a further $11 million directly from ING accounts into those of Paspali, Bulgari and Chanel. There's a couple of million dollars still unaccounted for, and she spent more than $18 million on eight apartments. We have properties, okay. There's four in Bondi, there's um, two in Kirribilli and one at three at Kirribilli. And how did you purchase those? Through the funding from corporate services. Okay. Through ING? Yes. Okay. Did she think that she wouldn't get caught? Uh, the personality that does that uh, type of uh, spending and commits those sort of offences, they, they never believe they're going to get caught. Um, they just keep going on until eventually they, they do. But, I mean, five years is a long time to be committing offences of this size. And the frightening thing is, Regina very nearly did get away with it. When she was arrested, ANZ Bank had almost completed a takeover of ING. Regina's department was about to shut down and she was banking on any evidence of her crime vanishing in the process. All she had to do was remove her multi-million dollar stash from the office. What are we going to do with all the jewellery? Take it to the Red Cross or, you know, donate it or something. Or was she planning to bundle it into a recently rented safe at Westpac Bank? Were we there? There for the safe at Westpac. The safety deposit box? Yes. Okay. Is, is it two separate safety deposit boxes or um, is it two? Two doors, which... Oh, okay, so double door, yes. turn it and lock it? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And you, said you, you said you've had this for a couple of weeks? Yes, you? yeah. Nothing, never used it? No, no. What eventually brought Regina unstuck was the suspicions of an executive at Paspali who became alarmed at the source of all the money she was spending. By then, Regina had splurged $13 million at the exclusive jewellery store. Much of it was paid directly from ING's accounts. The regional CEO phoned me at home on the Friday evening and said that they'd been alerted to someone within the company embezzling money and it was a female member of staff. I said immediately it had to be Regina. Do you feel sympathy towards her at all? None at all, no. Why not? Because what she did was um, incredible. I just, um, I can't understand why someone who had a good job and worked in a, a company that had taken care of them all those years would want to embezzle all that money. Coming up... How many accounts do you have? The search for the missing millions. Still two to three million that I know wasn't accounted for. As the victims count the cost. All of you have been extremely polite. Homeless. Penniless. I think it's very sad that you just end up in such a mess. Regina Subramaniam was under arrest. Over five years, she had swindled $45 million from ING, becoming one of the biggest fraudsters of all time. Um, how many accounts do you have? Uh, just um, with St George and ANZ in the Westpac. Now the painstaking job of finding where all the money went began. A lot of what's happened is it's only been in the last few months. So all the transactions have only happened in the last few months. She seems quite calm and open in the police interview. Was she telling the truth? 
Uh, to a large extent she was. Uh, she was quite open about what she had done, although she didn't give us the exact time frame that she had been committing the frauds. Regina was eventually sentenced to 15 years jail, reduced to 11 years after she appealed. But most of the $45 million she stole was never recovered. Regina did send money offshore. Do you think that there's still money for her to have when she gets out of jail? Could be, yeah. There's still uh, two to three million that I know wasn't accounted for. Do you think that the company had justice in jailing Regina or do you think that people escaped without being punished? Oh yes, I think the husband and the supervisor should have been made accountable because they put her into that role knowing that she wasn't capable of the position. Regina's husband continues to stand by her and even though ING did not recover the majority of the stolen money, the couple were allowed to keep their Castle Hill home. One would find it hard to believe that he didn't know what was going on given the contents at their suburban home, but there was never any evidence to say he knew or, or assisted in causing the transfers to happen. What did you think hearing all of this come out in court? Um, absolutely devastated. Devastated that these people had manipulated the company for their own gratification. And all of the, this strange three-way relationship, it's, it's all a bit sordid. Yes, and if you knew the people, you wouldn't, you, you would find it hard to believe. Regina's now in jail and mm. she drives a forklift there as her job. What do you think of that? Well, it's a far cry from the Mercedes she used to drive. <laughs> Like Regina Subramaniam, flamboyant conman Dimitri DeAngelis has also had to adapt to a far more modest lifestyle behind bars. I think it's very sad when you had dinners and a beautiful moments with people that you just end up in court and in such a mess. Jailed for 12 years, Dimitri certainly won't be driving a Rolls Royce or hobnobbing with the high flyers anytime soon. Sadly, those he swindled have also had to adjust to dramatic change. Financially, how did Dimitri leave you? Homeless. Penniless. You had nowhere to live? No, for 12 months. Um, so my son and I had to be sleeping on day beds and things until we both got a job um, and had enough money to find a place of our own. But amazingly, despite all she's lost, Lorraine Velichkovich is still able to focus on the good times she shared with Dimitri. Because I never dreamt that big, um, he allowed me to open up my whole world, what was possible, what I could do with him. And then when it, when it didn't happen, that it was a bit higher to fall than my little average life. Are you angry at Dimitri? No, I feel sorry for Dimitri. Really? After what he did to you? I can honestly say I'm not angry at him because he's sick and... Well, maybe he's just greedy. And he's greedy, but if I believe someone of, of that calibre, what he's done to just not me, to so many good people, that he's sick. He, he, he needs help. If you get involved in something you don't know anything about, you're going to get in trouble. So if, if, if these people were experienced entertainment industry people, they wouldn't have gone anywhere near him. It's because they're getting involved in things that they have no idea about. And then if you don't understand something and it's quite bamboozling to, to you, that's because it's done on purpose. You're not supposed to understand it. People do say hope is the last thing that dies, but it, I think it's a great study in, uh, in, in what makes people there's only one Dimitri in this world, I tell you. <laughs>